Now, what is our policy framework and recommendations? The White Paper proposes that the government of the Republic of South Africa must review and or withdraw from the 1951 Convention and the 1967 Protocol with a view to accede to them with reservations, like many other countries did. All what the South African government intends achieving is to exercise its right granted in Article 42 of the 1951 Convention and Article 7 of the 1967 Protocol and make reservations accordingly. The refugee protection and immigration legislation must provide for reservations and exceptions as contained in the 1951 Convention and 1961 OAU Convention, particular, uh, particularly in that South Africa does not have the resources to grant all the socioeconomic rights envisaged in the 1951 Convention. Remember, these rights were developed for all the countries, rich and poor, and there will be those countries which won't find it a problem, but others will. Let me come to citizenship. The genesis of the 1961 Citizenship Act is Citizenship Act 1995 and other laws. The current citizenship legislation, which is now presently in use in South Africa, has its root in the 1949 Citizenship Act and other relevant successive laws governing citizenship. The 1949 Act and other relevant laws were not only discriminatory on the basis of race, sex, but the native, as black people were referred to, were totally excluded from South African citizenship regime. The South African Citizenship Act provides for three main forms of citizenship, namely citizenship by birth, citizenship by descent, and citizenship by naturalization. Now, what is our policy proposal on citizenship? The White Paper must make radical proposals regarding citizenship. Section 4.3 of the Citizenship Act required to be reviewed together with other sections, including those relating to citizenship by naturalization during the legislative process. If you check the 1949 Act on which our 1995 Act is based, it talks about people of a sound mind. And you are aware that in a democracy, we can't live with that. So we need to make radical changes. The United States of America, Canada, Switzerland, and Britain are developed countries with resources that far exceed those of South Africa. And yet, they've developed st strict immigration, citizenship, and refugee laws in order to protect the right of their citizens. The Citizenship Act and the Birth and Death Registration Act must be repealed in their entirety and be included in the single legisl legislation dealing with citizenship, immigration, refugee protection. This will remove contradictions and loopholes in the path towards citizenship, as is now the case with the three pieces of legislation. The criteria for granting any forms of citizenship must be strictly in accordance with the law. A proper register should be kept for all persons granted citizenship by naturalization. The register must be tabled every year in Parliament by the Minister. Let me come to immigration. Before the Immigration Act 13 of 2002 was enacted, the applicable legislation was the Aliens Control Act and the Aliens Control Amendment Act. Now, when it comes to the issue of illegal foreigners, South Africa is today a great place to live in, and many people in the world aspire to live, work, or be the citizens of South Africa. In the results, many foreign nationals come to South Africa and stay in the country illegally, unfortunately illegally. No one can account 
for undocumented migrants, something which sometimes the media find difficult to understand, but we believe it's simple to understand. Because a person who has entered illegally in your country and do not go to announce themselves to authorities as provided for will remain unknown to authorities until that person is met by immigration officers or law enforcement people. The Department of Home Affairs has no idea as to how many illegal immigrants are in South Africa. However, immigration services between, deposit between 15 thousand and twenty thousand illegal foreigners every year and at the huge cost the number is on the increase obviously the establishment of the border management authority or bma should significantly re reduce the risk of illegal foreigners entering the country illegally and uh, dr masia pato the commissioner has on sunday released some figures to show the work that the Border Management Authority has done over a period of a year. The Immigration Act introduced fundamental change, albeit controversial, and a host of visas such as the temporary visa, study visa, business visa, critical skills visa, corporate visa, spousal visa, retirement visa, relative visa, intra-company visa, and permanent residence visa. Ladies and gentlemen, we believe this must be reviewed because we can't be having so many visas. It is an administrative backlog. I mean, a, a, a nightmare. It's an administrative nightmare to be able to administer so many visas. So there's a need to review the current visas under the Immigration Act. Visas such as the relatives visa, corporate visa, intra-company visa, might have to be abolished. The simple reason being that they are just a repetition. I mean, what's the difference between corporate, intra-company, business? They're supposed to be the same visa. They are one business. Why were they divided into so many subsections that causes administrative nightmares? So the white paper is proposing that that needs to change. Additional limited duration permanent residence visas linked to minimum investments will be introduced and e-visa for tourists and remote work visas, as you have heard. The introduction of limited duration permanent residence visa with minimum investments will add impetus to economic stimulus. The introduction of limited duration permanent residence visas will curtail the current difficulties in which individuals, business, and even church organizations and others resort to fraudulent means to acquire permanent resident status. Some of the proposed changes are already being implemented, ladies and gentlemen, as you know, as part of the Volintela Project's recommendations. Last week, I stood here in front of you to tell you about the recommendations of Volintela. So what the white paper is, is proposing, some of it is already happening. The maximum period to issue visas will be shortened. The new bodies to issue visas will have to strictly observe the new requirements. Transitional mechanisms will be built in in the new legislation to fast track the resolution of current backlogs. Let me come to policy proposals now on immigration. So the white paper proposes that border control must be coupled with immigration. <clears throat> that Border Management Authority Act must be reviewed to align it with immigration and citizenship new policy framework. You might actually be curious uh, to ask why are we the Border Management Authority is still a new baby. Why are you already making proposal about the amendment of this act? It's because, as we said, all these acts, citizenship, asylum, refugee protection, uh, immigration, uh, are sort of a continuum, and Border Management is part of that, and we believe they should not be separate, because when they are separate, they, they sometimes conflict with each other. 
the policy framework must provide for the establishment of the advisory board, which comprises representatives of the Department of Trade, Industry and Competition, Labor and Employment, Tourism, South African Police Services, South African Revenue Services, Education, International Relations and Cooperation, Defense and Military Veterans, uh, 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 Health, and also the Director General of the Department of Home Affairs. The board must also comprise representatives of organized labor, including four individuals on the grounds of expertise in administration, regulatory matters, or immigration law, control and adjudication and enforcement, which must be appointed by the minister. The current minister has published the news critical skills list in August 2022. The list has been trimmed down in respect of occupations and professions. The critical skills list is necessary to attract foreign skills required for the development of South Africa. The list was compiled in consultation with all relevant stakeholders, including NETLEC. Policy and legislative interventions are required to tighten the procedures and strengthening monitoring capacity by introducing integrated IT systems capable of flagging fraudulent activities in the issuing of visas, identity documents, marriage certificates, and passport. This includes giving wide statutory powers to existing anti-corruption unit within the Department of Home Affairs. The new policy must provide that members of the anti-corruption should be seconded from the South African Police Service. The relationship being that members of SAPS enjoy wide statutory powers including search, arrest, without warrant at times. Now, legislation must be introduced to strengthen the powers of immigration officers and inspectorate and make continuing training compulsory. The majority of members of the inspectorate must have legal qualifications and policing experience. The recent publication of the National Labor Migration Policy, introducing quotas for employment of foreign nationals will go a long way in diffusing similar tensions between South African citizens and foreign nationals. When the Immigration Act was enacted, provision was made for the establishment of immigration courts. However, the Immigration Act was amended in 2004 to remove the establishment of such courts. Now, the Immigration Division and Immigration Appeal Division, new policy framework and legislation intervention is required to establish the immigration division whose members are duly qualified to deal with granting of various visas. The current system is unworkable and staff members are overworked. Appeals reviews are dealt with by the DG and the minister. Given the responsibilities that we have, it is impossible for them to deal with the appeals or the reviews. Given the current challenges, there is merit in stabilizing an independent, in stabilizing an independent body to deal with appeals or reviews, such as Immigration and Refugees Board, Immigration Division, Refugee uh, Pro uh, Protection Division, and Immigration Appeal Division. We want to refer to some of the countries, like Canada, where the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act of 2001 in Canada makes provision for Immigration Refugee Board, consisting of Refugee Protection Division, Refugee Appeals Division, Immigration Division, and Immigration Appeal Division. Uh, and Special Immigration Appeals Commission. The Canadian equivalent of Refugee Status Determination Officer is the Refugee Protection Division. And maybe I need to explain. When somebody comes into South Africa, 
demanding refugee status or wishing for asylum status and uh, 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 eventually becomes a refugee. They visit one of the five refugee reception centers and there the person who listen to their story is called an RSDO or refugee status determination officer. Now we found that in advanced countries they've got refugee protection division. This is a statutory body charged with responsibility of taking decisions on asylum applications. In order to avoid backlogs, its members are appointed on a full-time basis in terms of the Canadian Public Service Act. In other words, like the Refugee Protection Division, uh, they, 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 they perform functions that are assigned to the RSDOs in South Africa in terms of the Refugee Act. And the, the RDP conducts proper hearings with asylum seekers being afforded the right to legal representation. This will obviate the long-winded and tedious appeal process under the current legislative framework in South Africa because every case or almost every single case adjudicated and finalized by a refugee status determination of South Africa is going on appeal. Nobody accept the, the, the final determination by the refugee status determination officer. There's always an appeal, which is an ending, and that develops backlogs. A party that is aggrieved by the decision of the refugee, uh, of the refugee protection division in countries where they use that system must appeal to the refugee appeal division with majority members being appointed for full time on the basis uh, 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 on a full time basis and 10% of whom must be members of the bar or are 20 for at least a period of 5 years so these are highly legally trained people which is not the case in 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 in, in our case in in the case of South Africa furthermore the canadian legislation clearly makes a distinction between economic immigrants and refugees. The same approach is adopted in the white paper. We are adopting the approach that there must be a special dispensation for economic migrants. We can't keep on pretending that they are refugees when they are not. In the United Kingdom, adjudication, adjudicators rather, equivalent to refugee status officers in South Africa, must be members of the Bauer attorneys for a period of seven years. The strict qualification requirement in Canada and UK are because asylum matters are by their nature very complex and involve international refugee law. If you don't believe me, just read the various judgments which we refer to in the white paper. You'll see that even judges among themselves differ on how to interpret international refugee law. Now, further policy framework proposal on refugee. The new policy framework and legislative measure must include the establishment of structures such as we, we, we have in, in these other countries like Canada. The decision-making powers will be quick and virtual hearings can be introduced at the points of entry, as in countries like the Netherlands. Consideration will be given and provided for in the new integrated legislation to appoint either serving judges or retired judges or senior counsel as chairpersons of the appeal bodies that I've referred to. That is our proposal in the white paper. We want the very highly qualified people like retired judges to sit and make these decisions because, as I've said, decisions made by people who are regarded as junior are always subjected to appeals. In instances of unlawful entry into the Republic, an additional requirement must be introduced that must show good cause for their unlawful entry or presence. The minister should be empowered to declare an asylum claim made by an asylum seeker who has a connection to a first safe country invalid. In other words, the first safe country principle must be strictly applied. This will include a person who may apply to be 
recognized as a refugee in that state. I think I need to explain this a little bit because uh, it has raised controversy uh, even at the international level because countries have been asking, if you are running away from a country which is recognized by United Nations High Commissioner for Refugee as a country that is in trouble where which can generate refugees. If you enter the first safe country, in other words, the first country where the issues that made you run for your country are not there. Like, uh, as you know, the convention speaks about war, it speaks about natural disasters, it speaks about pro uh, prosecution on the basis of uh, your political activities, your religious practices, your traditional beliefs, and even your, your gender, uh, your sex, uh, as in LGBTQW, there are countries which prosecute those. Now the question is, if you run into a country which does not have those, why do we pass? If I may ask it directly, because it was asked in parliament, why do people pass so many safe countries to specifically come to South Africa? Why can't it be a policy that once you pass through a safe country, that's why you must apply for asylum. Members of the media will remember, because some of you also asked the questions on our behalf of the Afghan uh, 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 citizens who came via Bay Bridge, Bay Bridge and the matter even went to court. They first went to Pakistan. They left and went to Qatar. They left and went to Zimbabwe. Then they left and went to Zambia, but it's only in South Africa where they are applying for asylum. And the question is, all the other countries that they went through, Pakistan, Qatar, Zambia, Zimbabwe, do not have all these things which they may run, have run away from, from the Taliban. Why specifically South Africa? And countries are asking these questions because it burdens one country when there are so many which can share the burden. So we are proposing the white paper that this principle of first safe country must be looked at seriously and be applied, or at least us in South Africa, we want to legislate on it. This policy framework will, be, will discourage asylum seekers who deliberately fail to apply for asylum in the first safe country, as I've already said. Exemptions, exemptions and economic migrants. Given the challenges of economic migrants, the exemption should be retained and the minister must exercise such powers in exceptional, exceptional cases. Agri South Africa, in its comments on the white paper, agrees with the policy options but proposes that the special exemptions should be granted in the agricultural sector which has for years also relied on unskilled foreign labor. The Department of Home Affairs is ready and willing to enter into public-private partnerships with such organizations as Agri-South Africa to tackle the issue of economic migrants by agreeing on quotas as proposed in the labor migration policy submitted by the Department of Labor and Employment to the Department of Home Affairs and to NETLEC. The provision for special exemptions will cater for economic migrants and reduce the number of economic migrants who come posing as asylum seekers and refugees. Furthermore, it will address the burning issue of em employers resorting to hiring illegal migrants. I want to come to the contagious issue of informal shops, what is are colloquially referred to as spaza shops. The spaza shops owned by foreign nationals require effective regulation. In a workshop held in October 2023 and attended by the House of Traditional Leaders, District and Metro Mayors, South African Local Government Association, SALGA, and relevant government departments. In this case, it was housing, 
small business, COCTA, and Department of Trade, Industry, and Competition, they all attended uh, this workshop at the ministerial level, except Trade and Industry and Competition, which sent the Director General, which we believe is senior enough. Firm resolutions were adopted in this workshop to conduct an audit of all spaza shops in the country by municipalities. This is with a view to have all spaza shops registered and establish the immigration status of the owners. Furthermore, municipalities will have to introduce bylaws to regulate the location and other requirements such as health and safety. Ladies and gentlemen, we have heard about many stories of children eating food from spaza shops, either dying or getting sick, and people not being able to understand what's happening, and it results in some people wishing to chase away foreign nationals. We believe this thing must be regulated. So when we say manu municipalities must introduce bylaws, we're just talking. The minister of Cogta has already developed draft bylaws as agreed in the workshop in October. I have seen the copy of those bylaws. We have set together as a department and made inputs to the bylaws because we want them to be in line with the present Immigration Act. Traditional leaders will play an important role in respect of informal shops located in their communal land because they are also complained a lot and they attended that workshop. So we're not going to have a spaza shop that is hanging, if I may explain this area again. We want them audited. We want the owners to come forward and the spaza shop be registered. And when you register, we want documentation. If you don't have documentation, we'll obviously have the spaza shop closed. That is the proposal we made to the minister to put in that series of bylaws. If, on the other hand, you have got the right to be in South Africa, all that is left is for you to register. And after registration, you will have to register with South African Revenue Services and start paying tax on that spaza shop. If you are in the bracket of tax paying, that will be determined by SARS and not us. Then, as I said, the Department of Health will have to make standards and say we are giving you this registration and these are the conditions. One, some of the conditions which will demand on which we have made an input is that you cannot sell food in this spaza shop and sleep there and cook there and eat there and wash inside there and hold prayer or Sunday services in there. That will have to be abolished. And that's the proposal that we are making in the white paper. But as I said, we have already made this input to the Minister of Cogta. And we are aware that she said after our input, she will send it to other stakeholders like municipalities to put their input before that act uh, that is passed as policy. Conclusion, I take this opportunity to thank all the concerned citizens and staff of the Department of Home Affairs who worked tirelessly in developing this policy framework contained in the final white paper. The constructive comments and criticisms played a significant role in shaping this final white paper. An explanatory memorandum will accompany the distribution of the white paper to the public at large, and we are going to annex it to this speech. A complementary and integrated bill based on this final white paper, will be introduced in Parliament without any further delay. You are aware that the white paper is just a policy. And acts of Parliament must be based on this. So very soon, a bill will have to be introduced in Parliament to bring this white paper into operation. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Minister. Um, 
we will now open the floor for questions. Please identify yourself and the media house which you represent. Sorry, I can't do that. <laughs> yes, you can. <laughs> Technology. And also, you mentioned that uh, the city what, what, what do you mean? White paper is not finalized. Oh, I mean it's not a it's not an actual law at the moment. You know, it still has to go through parliament and the NCOP and everything. No. No. Uh, before you go on, this is the, this is the final white paper because the pa cabinet passed it last week. It's final, meaning it's final policy. It's policy of the country now. Because cabinet has passed it. What will so then happen? Yes. No, no, I, I'm sorry to cut you short because I don't want you to continue with the question on the basis of wrong information. This is a final white paper, that's why I kept on saying final, final. Because it has been passed by cabinet after public uh, comments. What is still due going to parliament is that a white paper or a policy document is not. It's not, an, it's not a, how do I put it? It's not legislation. It's a policy. You still have to develop a law based on that policy. Look at the Marriage Act, the Marriage Act which is now in front of Parliament. If you remember, we started with the green paper, then the white paper, and we debated. Then we put the bill. It is now a bill in Parliament. We are going to do the same here because the white paper said the Citizenship Act, the Refugee Protection Act, the Immigration Act, there ought to be one omnibus legislation with different chapters. And that will be in the bill. And if Parliament passes it, then it becomes a law. But this white paper is now policy of the country. As from the 10th, I mean, uh, as from not the 10th. On the 10th, the, the cabinet passed it. As from today, because it's now gazetted officially. It has just been gazetted today. If you go to the government gazette, you'll find it. So it's policy of the country. Thank you. No, then you can go on with your question. Uh, my other half of the question was uh, the prospect of social education against the Helen Sussman Foundation, especially as it's now at the Supreme Court of Appeal, using this particular policy, which is now a policy of the country. And also you mentioned that the Citizenship Act provides for three main forms of citizenship by birth, by descent, or by naturalization. And it needs to be repealed. What are some of the loopholes that you feel that this particular act uh, needs to be... Uh, uh, just just to come be? again. Uh, you were saying that the SA Citizenship Act provides for three main forms of citizenship, which is by birth, by descent, and by naturalization. But you feel that it should be repealed. What are some of the loopholes that you feel should be addressed in terms of repealing this particular act? Okay, thanks. Um, do we have questions on the WhatsApp platform? We don't. Oh, okay. I think that's the only question, Minister. Yes. Uh, there are just two more. I'm, not, I'm just curious why when you talk litigation, you mention Helen Sussman Foundation, when there could be so many litigants. Yes, there can be many. South Africa today is a litigious country. Not anything you do is left alone. It's usually litigated on, I, I know because politically, I, the ministry that deals with the IEC, even if it's independent, is the minister, Ministry of Home Affairs. And time and again, we get litigation, even now. There's litigation every day because people do not agree. What I have found to be uh, quite disturbing is that whenever people don't agree with something, they immediately declare that is unconstitutional. It looks like the, the, the constitution is used as a paper to pull the country backwards. We cannot, it looks like we are trapped somewhere as a country, somewhere where we can't move forward because people believe there's a constitution. I mean, I uh, 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 just to expand, this present legislation that brought independence to parliament, we were told it's unconstitutional every single day people appearing on the media 
which of course the media call experts. Because I've learned, and, and I'm sorry, I need to apologize to the media before saying what I'm going to say, but I must say it. I have realized that any person who opposes the state on any issue, the media give them a title of expert, simply on the basis of opposing the stand. Whereas in my book, I thought an expert is somebody who is very highly knowledgeable on a subject without taking sides, like uh, there the are professors in some in our universities and uh, people with PhDs who have written uh, uh, thesis and all that, who are experts on particular fields, but the people who are given title of expert is anybody that stands forward and oppose the state or oppose the position of the state. So yes, we expect that. There are going to be, even after this, uh, I'm going to watch TV tonight, there are going to be lots of experts jumping from the ground like mushrooms, you know. Yes, most, most of the news are going to tell you, ah, the minister read this paper, but experts, experts say it's wrong, nonsense. Experts say they are going to challenge it. So we are used to that in the days two more, and we are ready for that. The, the issue of Citizenship Act, uh, you are asking what are some of the loopholes in the Citizenship Act. Uh, le let me try to explain, because people might not be aware of that. Because uh, we spoke about citizenship by birth, by descent, and by naturalization. But the three broader principles in the world of awarding citizenship by various countries, broadly, they follow three broader principles. The, the first one is called uh, uh, just uh, 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 sanguinis. I don't know whether it's spelled Jews or just, but J-U-S. I suspect it, it, they want to say jurist. Uh, uh, jurisdiction or something like that. Uh, sanguinis. Sanguinis is a is a citizenship. Is uh, 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 excuse me. It's a Latin word for blood. When you say just sanguinis, you means the right of blood. That is what you call citizenship by birth. You mean this person has got the right to be this country by virtue of their blood. Under that system of the right of blood, it does not matter where you are born doesn't matter. As long as just one of your parents belongs to that country, even if they've been absent from that country for a long time, that's why children of freedom fighters or children of parents who went into exile during the apartheid war in South Africa, it doesn't matter where they were born. Some came when they were already 40 years or so, but they are South Africans by virtue of Jewish sanguinis. That's citizenship by, by birth. Then the second one, which many people believe South Africa should be following or ought to be following, is just uh, solely the right of soil, meaning the soil on which you are born, then you become a citizen of that. Then the last one, which will also encompass naturalization, is, is what they call citizenship by merit, where you just give somebody citizenship deliberately, not because they've got any attachment to your country, but because you want your skills, their skills like soccer, soccer stars. I'm sure when you, you watch the French team marching onto the pitch during World Cup, you'll think it, it is from Africa because those people were given citizenship by that. Now, in our case, we've got this in our Citizenship Act of 1995, but we say it has got many weaknesses. That's why we want to change it. One of them, we said, it's a replica of the 1949 Citizenship Act under the Union of South Africa. What is the relevance of that? What was happening in 1949? In 1949, it was during the Union times. The British government was sending people here to become commissioners of this and that, governor of this and that territory. Countries like Botswana were called protectorates. British protectorates that needed the governor or a commissioner. Uh, like, Lesotho was a Basotho land, uh, uh, a protectorate, etc., etc. Now, all those people who were sent here were men, were men. They were never women. And the British government was worried because they know these are men. Wherever they are going, they are going to make babies. And the British government was worried that those babies, via 
juice sanguinis, the right of blood. They will claim citizenship of Britain. They will appear in Britain and say, my father originated from here. And I know you are using juice sanguinis. So this is my country. The British government was very worried about it, of the prospect of seeing dark figures rushing over the oceans to Britain and claiming citizenship. So they wanted to make a special law to stop them and confine them to the, to the territories or the colonies. And they passed that act. That's why when you read that act, it keeps on saying, father, mothers never exist. Because they were talking about fathers from Britain, it takes from same father, father. Now, what worries us is when you read our 1995 act, they just replace the word father by parent. But the act most of the part remains the same. And that's why things like you must be of a sound mind. And we believe that was targeting Africans specifically, where any, any white person can just rule that this one is not of the sound mind and only Europeans have got a sound mind. And, and that our act is replicating that, is worrying us greatly. And that's why we believe it must be changed. And of course, we are also worried by the amendment which was made, that I, which I referred to here as section 43, which says, if you are born in this country by two foreign parents, and you stay here, you don't go anywhere, when you turn the age of mayor, that is 18, you have got the right to apply for citizenship away from your parents. What worries us is why all of a sudden there's a change? Why don't you follow the normal route of acquiring citizenship through naturalization? So those are the things that worry us, and that's why we want these changes. Uh, yeah. If there's any litigation, we'll deal with it, but we definitely expect, because I've never seen in recent days, anything done by a government not being litigated upon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister. Um, do we have any further questions? Okay, the visual platform. Sorry? Could you please see from Netverk? From what? Netverk. Netverk. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm not well versed with some of the media <laughs> houses. Network. Yes. Okay. The previous vision of the white paper had been criticized by Herman Mashara from Action SA for not doing enough to encourage skilled immigration to South Africa. Has this issue been addressed in the final vision of the white paper and how? Is that the only question? Okay. Follow up. Thanks. There, there are steps in the act, and we just want to fine tune them. But you may remember, you, uh, 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 of all people, that the Guptas naturalization was fast tracked on the basis that they are bringing investment. This matter even went to Parliament. That's why Parliament made a ruling that uh, any person who is fast-tracked in naturalization by the minister, within a particular period, I'm sure it's two weeks, the minister must go to report to Parliament. So they became aware and get convinced that this person ought to be naturalized. We want people to be naturalized also, not on the basis of fraud. That's what we are trying to do. You are aware that even prominent people, like Pastor Bushiri, referred to as a prophet, project prophet, he acquired a, our permanent residency fraudulently. And permanent residency is a step towards citizenship. Once you acquire that permanent residency, you are going to move fast to citizenship. And also, there was an issue of the period of stay, that if you stay for this particular long, inside the country, then you deserve a, a, a naturalization, which is what many countries do not practice. I mean, if you go now and study in China and stay there for 15 years, does not necessarily mean you are going to become a Chinese immediately. 
because you just have to you lie low there for 15 years. So those are the issues uh, that we want to look at. Uh, Met WC from Network, yes, uh, there are quite a number of people who, who, who put criticisms, especially about uh, the issue of critical skills. I don't know whether it's Herman Mashaba only who did that. We always meet with business. If you look at the Volindela report, it was based on the issue of skills, critical skills. And as we have heard in the white paper, we, are, we have actually put it there. But at the time, they were criticizing the white paper. We were already dealing with the issue of critical skills because the president, if you remember, mentioned this in the State of the Nation address, which I will really ask you to go and read, of 2022. He said the visa regime of the country will need to be reviewed so that we bring critical skills in the country, which will drive investment, which will drive economic development, which will create jobs. And so that's why he appointed uh, uh, the veteran Mavusom Simang to review all these visas and made recommendations. So we have just decided to put them in the white paper, but some of them are already been implemented, like what I said uh, last week. But you remember, unfortunately, we, we had to withdraw them because there were several problems and I promise that they will re, re uh, publish them this week but after the cabinet made their inputs on the white paper there were so many new proposals they made that it took all our time so we are not in a position unfortunately to republish those uh, regulations as, as we promised because all our time was taken by the white paper because uh, there were so many inputs that we had to cooperate, including, as I said, those from cabinet. So, so yes, we, we are looking at the issue of skills. You are aware that we, we have even, uh, met WC, we have even introduced something called the Trusted Employer Scheme, whereby employers who want to bring people here faster do not have to depend on the pace of home affairs. They themselves are allowed by this new policy to go around the world collecting all those documents, be they proof of qualifications, proof of experience, bank statements, uh, 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 police clearance reports, etc. The employer will be allowed to collect those, not us, and bring them to us, and we issue them the visa immediately, provided that when we do a rom down check, we must not find that they've misrepresented themselves. All those are in line with skills. The other thing, which is also in the white paper, is about the critical skills. In terms of the practice, the critical skill list was gazetted every four years, which means we review every four years. Our proposal here, which we are already doing, by the way, is that you don't have to wait for four years. If a company or a group of people or whatever institution tell you that this skill is critical, and we debate it and we find that indeed is critical, then we can amend, we can gazette rather, the critical skills list so that it doesn't wait for four years. And this has already happened, uh, I think, uh, last year it has already happened twice, where we, we gazetted skills which were before not gazetted. As I'm, uh, I've read here, I say, the, the gazette was done in August 2022. But in 2023, within one year, we already re it twice because we want the issue of skills to flow in the country. Thank you very much.